Howdy Friars, welcome to demo day on October 15th. Now it is. Um, we're going to demo a couple of things and just give some brief updates. Uh, the first thing we'll demo is the, just a minor change to governance, just more like a quality of life improvement, uh, which we should have governance launched, I think, next week. It should be next week. Um, anyway, the, the interface has seen a few minor changes, so I'll show those. Then Chris is going to show off the um, changes to the new, uh, you know, the redesigned foundrydow.com mock-up. Uh, and also show off a bit of the back end and how we're building that to be just a lot easier to maintain. Uh, then Skalk will give a presentation on the uh, the Leverly token, right? Is that right, Skalk? It's on the Leverly token, right? Not yeah. the long short pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is going to be sort of the monetization strategy slash platform for Deeth and Deeth's uh, successor. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, and we'll probably just sprinkle in some updates as we go and as we think of them. So um, actually, Chris, if you wouldn't mind doing your stuff first, I'm just going to prepare my desktop for demoing. If you're if you're ready at the moment. Sure. If you can enable the screen sharing. There you go. Common link. Okay, while well, that link loads, I'll chat about about the back end a bit. So the way we've built the new Foundry back end, the I, I think as we mentioned previously, there is no CMS or anything. So if you want to update content, it's just a bit of a mess. So we're using Strapi. It's a headless CMS with. So what it basically does is it creates the data structure for you. So you specify data types or pages, as I'll show now. And then it creates the database structures for you in the back end. Um, so let me actually see if I can just open the, the database as well and I can demo that. And what it then does is after it creates these data structures for you, it exposes those structures to all the common API endpoints. So we'll be using Next.js for the new site to build the new design. Um, yeah, so let me quickly show the back end. The Strapi back end is, is very simple. It doesn't really have a lot of stuff. Uh, at first, it seems to be very you know, minimalistic, but we can see here that we both, we've got blogs, Excel links, pages, products, tech partners, users, and then obviously media. And if I just go into pages, for instance, the way this works is we create different pages for each page, the front end needs to construct, and then we add these blocks. And within the blocks, we've got all the different metadata. So, and then in each, of the metadata sections, we can add the entries. So title, description, image. And so the cool idea about this is if the data ever changes or there's some a change to the roadmap or anything, anybody can just come in to the back end after update the data. Obviously, you have to have access. And then we just rebuild the front end and that's the changes will be live. So making changes to the roadmap and those kind of things will be easy. And we're gonna make as much as possible of this dynamic as well. So if you let's say want to add an entry to the roadmap, you just add a row to the back and it gets built on the front and you don't have to redesign the image or anything. Um, yeah, and then what Strapi then does is it creates, we use a, oh, my IP address is blocked, but we use a Postgres SQL backend and it creates all the tables and data structures for you automatically. So that's pretty nice. So that's just in terms of, sorry, I shared the wrong screen. In terms of progress with the backend, we're basically done with this. So at the current velocity, we should be able to start building the actual code for the website on probably Monday or, or Tuesday. Um, yeah, so I'll just show off the designs as well. I'm for a moment not entirely sure if we showed this last week, but we did add this foundry circle of life, which is basically, it shows the process in which Foundry operates. Um, and then we added the video. And then there was another section. I'm just wondering why these images. Let me just quickly refresh the link. I uh, wonder what's that? going on. Yeah. That one on XD, it seems to be having, uh, Adobe's platform seems to be having problems mm. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, for me, the, the exciting part of using Strapi is um, it, it moves us from having a website that's extremely difficult to update 
to one that's obviously very easy and quick. And part of the value there is that um, as Foundry becomes more decentralized, it will make it easier for the community to update this, you know, without having to go find an HTML editor. Uh, it'll just—it's just an easier property to, I think, for a decentralized community to actually manage. So that's part of the win that I see. Just, just a question: Our front end for for the website is generated how with uh, React or what? So the front end is generated by Node.js, and we're using React. Yes, we're, we're going to use Next.js. But that's compiled by React, yes. And then that query is using GraphQL, it queries Strapi to actually get the data. So, yeah. Okay, so so, so I'm right in, in saying that Strapi's main, main purpose is just to be like a specialized content DB then, essentially. Like, yeah, it's a CMS, a content management yeah. system, a headless one. So it doesn't generate like WordPress mm -hmm. front end. WordPress generates a front end as well. So it's monolithic, but Strapi has no front end. It just has an API endpoint, which you query at compile and then you build all the elements. So the idea is also as you add or remove products, it's added, a circle is automatically added and the page is generated. So that stuff is mm -hmm. dynamic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's but very, I, mm, it's very it's only queried at compile. So if the backend goes down the website, the binaries that have been compiled keep on being hosted on Netlify or whatever we use to actually compile oh. the website. Yeah, so the oh, back end can that. go. Okay, that's, that's, that's yeah. what, what do you kids think of next? That's so clever. Yeah, so yeah, the back end is literally, and so the cool thing about that is we can actually make branches for different front end deploys and preview changes before making them live merge and uh -huh. then front end is rebuilt. And I just wanna show <clears throat> what we also did for hosting Strapi to make it easy for anybody to manage is we started with a droplet, but I spent some time to, so droplet is basically a virtual machine. So you have to maintain a whole stack, the operating system, all the packages, batchy, engine all that stuff. But what we've done now is actually to use a new feature from DigitalOcean called their app app platform. That it, you know, they just call it apps, but it's the app platform. And so what this actually does, and the difference between this and Netlify is this thing deploys the code and it's actually able to host a Node.js server, whereas Netlify, only runs Node.js at, at compile and then outputs a static front end. But this is this is actively running the Node.js code. So I can go into the console here and I can actually see there's a strappy directory. So mm. it's limited to only our code. So you can't actually access operating system features. But the fact is you've got an active console here and the, this is as easy as literally cloning our repo and just compiling the code, passing the correct variables, and there you have it. So almost no maintenance needed, and it's also super cheap. We I think it's fifteen, ten or fifteen dollars a month for nice. this for this backend. Yeah. So we really yeah, wanted that's... to make that very modular and and easy to maintain for anybody. Let me actually see. Just want to check on the costs. Yeah. So it's ten dollars a month to to run this. Yeah, um, so that's our backend. Um, we also use spaces to store files. That's also DigitalOcean. We put all of this into one foundry project. So it's very easy for us to transfer it around if needed. Um, so uh, yeah, on the front end. We... Uh... So sorry, yeah. very stupid question. My, my infrastructure knowledge is now quite a few years out of date. Um, how, do we, how do we like ship that thing from a DigitalOcean somewhere else if we need it? So that's the cool thing because Strapi itself is written in Node.js. We can actually just, you, you go to our GitHub repo and you close, you compile that on whatever cloud provider you want. So anything that's able to run the correct version of Node.js will be able to compile it and, and run the app. So you can, we can run it on Google Cloud, Amazon. Okay, but our, our database Heroku. is here, right? So, but, but we'd have to clone our database as well. If we yes, the do, database lives here as yeah. well, but it can live anywhere. But yeah, it's, it would be okay. as easy as just exporting the database, importing it there, changing. And that's also the cool thing. We didn't hard code anything. So if you want to move the database to a different provider, you just go to the app. We've, we've okay. made the app so that its connection string looks for an environment variable. So you just go into the app's um, mm. environment variables. Yeah, so like I said, I, I'm not sure if we showed this. If we didn't, this is just the foundry circle of life. Some of the text might still change. 
the rest of the stuff everyone has seen. And then the product sliders are in. So as you slide through the, the you click through the different products, you'll, you'll notice the content changing there at the bottom. And with a product that we have the full branding for, which is Leverly, you can notice the image changing as well. We also added the blog section. So this is the blog archive page and then the blog. As I'm sharing this, it, it feels like I have shown this. I can't remember whether it was in the demo day or whether it was in one of our stand-up calls. Mm, if it was in last week's, uh, <laughs> I feel, no. feel very stupid. But here's also a demo of the article single page. If the image is not set, we'll just use a default one. And then we've been working on something is wrong with this link because the, I'm not seeing the other pages. Hmm. Um, okay, Logan, I don't know if you want to quickly just run through your stuff. Let me see if I can sure. get this thing to show the other pages. Yeah, might not be pretty quick here. Okay, so yeah, just loading this site. The only change really is that this loads quickly. There's five of them. Um, and I don't need to connect my wallet. So those are just a few small quality of life changes we had for the governance. Um, Maybe just page through a bit, go to the next page, go back again. Because right. it is a lot, much faster. We used to only fetch three, which was taking yeah, like five was, to 10 seconds. And it was loading them. Now we're actually. fetching. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're fetching five. At, yeah. And it loads this quickly. So. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, that's my demo. <laughs> I think we just need to also update on the governance backend, getting all the contracts ready, deploying them to live. I mean, we have five contracts at the moment yeah. and we have to finalize all the time locks. Then we have to deploy them all to the mainnet, pay the gas fees, get them verified, update the code to point to the new contract. So unfortunately, it's not like we can just press a button and make governance live. It is quite a bit of a process. Then we have to run through all of it again and test everything from start to finish with the actual time locks, which will take several days because we'll have to set actual values and see whether they work. Right. And then another thing we'll have to do is in time, we'll also have to get our smart contracts for the governance audited so that we can register on that DAO website. There's a, what well, was it called, Logan? Well, there's a few different DAO aggregators that typically what they ask for is like, where is your smart contract? So if we don't, you know, until yes. we have governance, we don't have a single smart contract for our project. Um, and that should, yeah. and that's obviously important because then we can get more exposure if we're on those lists. Um, yeah. But yeah, and then so as as far as what you were talking about, Elmer's current task, I uh, should start this on Monday, is to basically just write a, a, a script contract that itself sets up all the contracts. Um, so that's the next step. And then what's nice is that when that's done, then we'll be able to easily deploy governance for. So that's that'll actually go on um, Matic first, but then we can deploy it on Mainnet as well. And we could also probably use a similar script or the same one when we launch uh, the Lever, Leverly um, token. Um, but yeah, with that, maybe we can hand it off to Skulk and, and hear his presentation on Leverly. Okay, cool. Um, yes. Uh, is my screen live at the moment? My, um, you all see in my face, that's my one question. Yep. All right. Um, okay, let me just share a screen. Okay, so I'm going to work this into more of a nice video. I had some graphics, but they're outdated now as we um, did more design stuff. Uh, can you guys see the presentation? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, uh, Logan, if we can just add a tag in the I um, actually don't know how to do that. I don't know if you know how to do that. Just I, I just want to be able to add a tag. At, at, I actually don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll add the tag to our YouTube uh, video because I'd like okay. to just send this to the... Well, we can send a timestamp URL, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I meant, basically. Um, I sort of meant the segmentation, but it's not necessary. I'll, I'll find that. Anyway, okay. So, um, yeah, so basically I've been doing a, like quite a bit of design work um, and some smart contract work on constructing the uh, governance token for uh, the Leverly platform. So, so the purpose of this, this uh, token is um, basically to act as a governance token for, um, for the Leverly platform um, and as a value accrual token. That's sort of like its main goals. Um, 
let me just get here. All right, so um, let's just uh, get this stuff out of the way. All right, so one of the things we want to do as founders, we want to split out Leverly as a totally autonomous project that can focus on its own priorities, right? So in other words, um, like uh, we we like to make all manner of radical statement and uh, Leverly just, just doesn't kind of need that noise. I mean, um, it's a very straightforward DeFi project is completely decentralized. Very little of it, um, you know, is... Uh, I'm going to say controversial beyond the fact that it is um, that, that, that it's sort of like a volatile uh, derivative on top of another um, set of cryptos that you can own, right? So, I mean, it's, it's just a DeFi product, essentially. I think it's a nice DeFi product, but it's, um, you know, it, it's not really like taking on the nation state or something to that effect. Um, so the second target that we have is we want everyone who has any FRI tokens um, and Foundry as a whole to actually benefit. So uh, what the Lever token will do is it'll... Um, it should also um, reward Foundry um, in proportion to the success of Levered Lee for Foundry's capital investment and the work done by um, its members. Uh, we also want to ensure that uh, interest in Leverly does not evaporate unnecessarily due to bad tokenomics. So for better or worse, uh, the problem is just if, if the token has the capacity to um, have interest uh, bleed out easily. Um, it's very possible for the project to go through quite tough times, as we have realized. And I mean, that's literally even something that happened to Ethereum in the early days. Uh, they had to fire the vast majority of people because they they sort of like started running out of uh, sellable capital. Um, yeah, luckily they recovered, um, but I mean, that could have been that could have been dealt in a more easy way. And the next the next goal of uh, the lever token is also to ensure maximum visibility. So in other words, we we actually want the token to, um, you know, if somebody looks for interesting tokens, like the token itself must look interesting. You know, um, it shouldn't look like something that had a flash in the pan moment and then sort of like just died, faded away. Right. So, um, yeah, so basically how Lever is created. Um, so these numbers are still somewhat pending, um, but, um, but, but we're sort of like we're, sorry this thing keeps sorry the thing keeps skipping um like pages all right so so some of the tactical targets we want is we want lever to be super scarce uh and uh, we want lever to be highly liquid at all times um and we uh want lever to exclusively go to contributors to lever's mission right so we want to minimize the um the amount of people who have an opportunity to arbitrage um Lever tokens who who aren't necessarily contributing in some in some way to the success of the project as a whole, right? So um, so this is kind of like the current plan that I have for how Lever should be created so that we can actually hit those goals, right? So the first thing is that Lever is uh, created on a curve cell, so zero Lever exists. Uh, there isn't there isn't really any team tokens. There's it, it, it should theoretically start at a balance of at an, either an incredibly low balance or a balance of zero. Then basically what happens you balance, is- You um, mean like a total supply, right? A, a total supply, yes. So right. a total supply of either a very small amount. Um, and uh, and that's still something we need to discuss internally um, because we, we do have some members who we'd like to obviously like reward somehow. So that's part of the, part of the puzzle that isn't fully colored in yet. But for the time being, we can assume that it's going to either be a very small amount or it's going to be zero. Um, and then basically lever gets created on a curve cell, right? So what a curve cell is, is it's just essentially a cell that starts at zero and works up to some maximum price, right? So currently the numbers I have in here is it starts at zero ETH per lever and it works its way up to eight ETH per lever. And it works right? its, way up, then, its way up as people buy, just to be explicit. Yes, as people buy, right? So the first guy can buy um, like a hundred he, he might be able to buy like maybe 10 lever for a very small amount of money. The last guy will pay, you know, a very, very large amount for, for 10 lever, for instance, right? So that's kind of like how the, how the situation scales up. Um, the current numbers that I have, and, and these numbers are based just on being able to put, to, to attract attention, is that we actually have like a very, very low token supply. So after the wholesale concludes, there'll only be 7,000, um, Sorry, there'll only be 7,000 lever um, in circulation, but the sale itself only sells off 2,000 levers. Now, if you go do the math behind this, that just essentially means that we raise a maximum of about 4,000 ETH, right? So the sale never ends. So it doesn't actually have to conclude. 
And the reason that the sale does the sale only ends basically once the last token has been sold. And the reason for that is just that if we gain attention the first day, or if we gain attention three years into the project, we actually want the capacity for um, that price interest to be captured by the project as a whole by the DAO and to actually like be able to then fund the mission of the um, of that DAO. Right. So for every four lever that's sold in the curve sale. Um, so, okay, so I, I know these numbers seem a little bit, bit strange. I didn't want to say for every one lever sold because I would have very small fractions and strange fractions here. But think about it this way. For every four lever that somebody comes along and buys, um, lever gets created for different uh, parties. The, the first set of lever obviously goes to the buyer, right? So four lever goes to the buyer, two lever goes to the lever treasury. Uh, this is actually split into two parts, but I didn't want to uh, clutter the thing here. But essentially, the leverly treasury gets um, two levers and the foundry treasury gets one lever. And then seven lever basically goes to permanently locked liquidity. Um, this last item here is necessary to establish a floor price. So in other words, what we what we don't want is we don't want a situation where this, the price has the capacity to skyrocket 100x uh, pull in a bunch of people and just essentially slam down, down back to the floor with absolutely nothing nothing down there, right? So the price might, I mean, we can't predict what the market will do, but what this last segment does is it is it basically ensures that if we raise a certain amount of lever tokens or if we, uh, if we raise a certain amount of ether, um, these lever tokens ensure that the total supply divided by the raised amount um, even if you sell all of these tokens, so in other words, all the tokens that were bought, all the tokens that went to the Leverly Treasury, it'll still be 25% of that total amount raised, right? So I'll go into more details um, on how that works uh, once I have the other graphics and the video and everything in place. Um, but that basically that basically ensures a pretty stable floor and a pretty high floor for um, you know for the token, right? So then all the ETH that that is raised, none of it goes to the team, none of it goes to the DAO itself, right? It all goes to permanently locked liquidity uh, that is owned by no one. So in essence, it, it goes to protect the uh, the price of the lever token, um, and uh, and yeah, and and then essentially the, the the these different parties who received lever, they're then free to actually sell their lever tokens back into that liquidity um, if they so chose, right? Um, Okay, so so there's no beneficiaries. It's not like your money, uh, your money comes to us, for instance. It's yeah. Um, I'll like I said, I'll, I'll flesh it out more in the um, in the complete video. So at the moment, the thinking is that we we take the ETH that we raise, and we put fifty percent of that into a ETH lever pool, and we put another fifty percent of that into a DETH lever pool that I'll go into. All right, then the, the last part is basically there's a treasury faucet. So the Leverly Treasury or the Leverly Governance receives a maximum of 10% per year of the current lever supply, right? So in other words, uh, the governance can, um, it'll have an income of whatever the total market cap of lever is, um, it'll have a yearly income of 10% of that amount, right? Now, if the governance chooses to burn that, that means that uh, uh, the lever token is, this is non-inflationary, right? So uh, the people who have lever tokens can actually decide how they want to spend that uh, money. And so if I could just right, round out the, just go back one slide, I just want to explain sort of yeah. benefits of that. The benefit is like we, we can, first of all, we, we cap the maximum inflation at 10%. So we don't give the treasury the minting key raw, we give it sort of protected in its 10% maximum. Um, and yet the treasury can basically choose to burn it. So uh, based on what the, uh, you know, the, the lever token holders choose, then if they want a non-inflationary token, they can vote to just have it at 0%. Or they can vote to have it up to ten percent uh, to, you know, send to governance rewards or or something like that. So that's uh, that's the nice combination of benefits we get by doing that. Yeah. So so please stop me and clarify or ask anything that's unclear here. Um, I don't mean to rush through it. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, that, that that's exactly that's exactly the purpose. There is um, we want to make sure that there is. Uh, there's a cap on spending from this governance, you know, so it's not like the government who just keeps spending as much as they, you know, they, they think there's an infinite supply of everything. This thing will have a capped supply, but it could make that, that additional amount that it gets, it, it could turn around and choose well, to burn that. Capped inflation to mm -hmm. be specific, not a capped supply. That's not exactly. 
yeah capped inflation correct yeah um okay so so the pools um yeah so essentially what we um what we aim to accomplish with the liquidity pools is that that we want the liquidity pools to be permanently available right so just as we have with the permafrost in fry we want uh, the capacity for somebody to sell the lever token um at any point in time right there must always be a buyer of last resort uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to maintain the lever value within reason. So in other words, we, we don't want it. We don't want a scenario where it, where it can slam around too absolutely ludicrously violently. Now, like I said, uh, there's a limit to how far we can protect that on, on how far it goes up. But on the downside, um, if all my math is correct, uh, it means that in ether denomination, the lever token should, it, it will be mathematically impossible for it to be worth less than a quarter of the total amount of money that was raised in the curve sale, right? Um, I can run through that math in, in a separate video, but, but that's essentially the um, uh, implication. The next thing is we want the pools to be independently productive. So even if the project goes dormant or if its main mission fails for some reason, um, the, the pools themselves will actually generate an income such that by implication, it's actually buying back the lever tokens automatically. And then the last thing we want is we, we wanted to generate attention, right? So in other words, uh, we, we want these pools um, and the token itself to actually have qualities that when people go look for new and interesting tokens, uh, this is one of the things that actually comes up. All right, so the pool construction. Um, so there are two pools. Uh, again, these are, these are somewhat preliminary numbers, although stuff's starting to solidify now. Uh, the one is that we have an Ethereum pool that uh, pairs to Lever that's 50-50 and has a 5% fee, right? So very similar to how the permafrost pool looks. And then the other pool is we have a DETH pool that's also 50-50, right? So these two pools exist in separation. So ETH, even if something goes wrong with the DETH system, the ETH pool um, you know, should remain mostly unaffected. Right, and the reason that we have two pools instead of just one pool is because the DETH and the ETH prices will vary. And essentially as they vary, um, that volatility will be, uh, will be able to farm that via the fee. Right, so as the, as the price of ether, fluctu ether fluctuates up and down, the price of DETH to ether will by definition fluctuate up and down. And every time those fluctuations move out of, out of balance and then back into balance, the pool, the value of the tokens in the pool will actually be larger than when it than what it was at the previous balance point, right? So, um, so, so what I just said there is those things act as a gravity well. So the fluctuations over time harvest the income, um, and, and sort of like create an income of lost resort for Liberty. Um, hold on for me a second. Uh, sorry, guys, just hold on a second. As <clears throat> as Skulk is yeah. holding the solidity, the project is solidifying. <laughs> yep. Lord, sorry, just say that again. I didn't hear that part. I just want to uh, throw some humor in, into the conversation here. So for all the thousands of viewers, to distract them from your background noise, but I was just saying, as you're building the solidity code, the project is solidifying. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> I hope so. Uh, the, the the oddly the easiest part of these things is, is, has proven to be the solidity. Um, Sorry for anybody yeah, so, that that's been watching until now. <laughs> well, okay, so yeah so essentially that's that's kind of like how the lever token that that's how we want to distribute the lever token is through this mechanism right so um so this should end up with a situation where there are very very few lever tokens uh they have a very high unit price um and they have a very high minimum unit price um and they actually have the capacity to uh just purely from ether price fluctuations sort of like um buy themselves back over time so actually like have an increasing price uh, yeah, and I will, uh, yeah, hopefully early next week, I'll, I'll construct more of a marketing video um, to, yeah, to explain this um, in a little bit more of a rounded way. Cool. All right. Well, the only other thing I wanted to um, 
quickly mention is that uh, we have a roadmap published. So it's a bit of a, it's not exactly a roadmap because it's not just forward facing. So it has the past to it. So it shows where we've been. Uh, and then it goes into sort of what we're looking at in the future. Maybe I could call it Foundry's story. I think it'd be a good thing to call it. In any case, um, that's published on Medium now. Uh, when the website goes up, we'll have probably a slightly updated version of that on the website too. Um, but uh, I'm going to link to that in the video, the show notes here. Uh, so check that out. And then there will be links in there that if you follow them around, you'll see um, a lot of the other articles we've written lately too. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for this demo day. Anything from either of you guys? Yeah, just lastly, to make this an actual YouTube video, let us know what you think in the comment section. Oh, and smash that like and subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. I'll smash it. We, smash we don't it. want clicking. Yeah, we clicking don't want is clicking. for. Yeah, clicking is for the weak. Smashing is for the Again, strong. Yeah, the this is where smash. you make it do the click animation on the screen with the. Right. Ding. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That sounds like work, but maybe I'll have to do it. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Alrighty. Have a great cool. weekend. Bye, YouTube.